Welcome, this is a recorded session of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Conference of the PKI Consortium. This conference would not have been possible without our sponsors in Trust, HID Global, and PQ Shield, and the organizational support of the Post-Quantum Cryptography Working Group of the PKI Consortium, in particular in Trust, Logius, TNO, and CWI. continue this session uh, with the contribution of uh, Dr. Stefan Ehlen, who holds a PhD in pure mathematics in number theory, is part of the CRIPA group at the German Federal Office for Information Security, the BASE, since 2021, and also an associate professor in mathematics at the University of Cologne in Germany. He works in post-quantum cryptography with a focus on Latin-based schemes and leads the BSI project on implementing post-quantum schemes in the open source crypto cryptography library. Thank you very much. Stefan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes, um, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here, and uh, we have this very nice audience, uh, a lot of people interested in uh, government policies, and I think we've heard uh, interesting updates from, from the US, um, from uh, some pr perspectives for the EU, and um, I'm here to give you a little bit of an update on the uh, policies that uh, the German uh, BSI has um, on post-quantum cryptography mostly. Um, so let's see if this works now. Yes. So uh, I guess I don't have to say much about the introduction anymore because uh, you mostly heard everything that's uh, on the slide. Um, maybe let me just uh, say that uh, if this trickery doesn't work at some point um, and I don't see the slides anymore, then I might just go on and talk about modular forms or something like that, which I used to do uh, in my previous life, before joining the uh, BSI in 2021. Um, and I'm still looking for the killer application of modular forms and cryptography and haven't found that yet, so we'll see what happens. Um, anyway, you, you all know why we're here. It's because um, in the event of um, large enough uh, error-corrected quantum computer becomes available, then uh, publicly cryptography as we know it will be broken. <coughs> and we need to um, migrates to quantum self cryptography. We've heard in previous talks, of course, um, there's post-quantum cryptography, and there's maybe also um, a lot of efforts uh, being done um, for quantum communication as another approach to this. And I'll say a little bit about the second one, about quantum key distribution, and what our policy is about that. Um, but I'll focus on post-quantum cryptography. And, uh, this is a conference about post-quantum cryptography. Um, maybe a little spoiler. Here, um, we, we definitely need to, we definitely think we need to focus on the migration to post quantum cryptography. PQD is not there yet, but we'll come to it uh, later. <coughs> so, what are we doing um, at BSI to uh, figure out somehow um, how urgent um, everything is, um, how uh, far the development has come with uh, quantum computers? Um, well, of course, uh, we trust sources like the Taylor Moscow study and so on. But we also <coughs> sorry, um, we also conduct our own um, studies, and um, the first one was published in 2018 and has been update, updated 2019 and 2020. Um, there's a new one coming out just this year. It has been finished, but we're just waiting for the final publication. Um, you, you'll find it online where you find the current one right now. I put up the link here. Um, just um, some insights from that. There's not been a big breakthrough. Um, Nevertheless, there have been new developments, and we always need to be aware of this, that um, whenever um, somehow uh, heuristics, uh, heuristic results are confirmed, there could be a major leap forward, and we need to be prepared for that. Um, that's uh, basically what we're looking at right now. Um, well, given that, we are working on, on this hypothesis, which we think is, um, let's say, good for conservative risk ma management, uh, risk assessment, uh, saying that, well, suppose um, there is a quantum computer available in the early 2030s, then um, I guess we're already too late. Um, but nevertheless, this is still our working hypothesis, and we're trying to prepare for that. So there's two basic scenarios, I guess, that make the transition urgent. The one uh, that we've heard a couple of times already was the store now, or harvest now, the later scenario where we really need um, quantum safe um, encryption, 
or quantum safe uh, key encapsulation mechanisms to be available. And <clears throat> for PKIs, usually the systems are quite complex. So you are the experts here in the room, so you know this. So migration might take a very long time. And so while we have been focusing a lot on the encryption part, focusing a lot and uh, emphasizing the scenario store now to put later and to be prepared for it, I think now it's really the time to also look at PKIs and um, even those signatures that you hand out right now are maybe not as much in danger as um, uh, your encrypted files are in danger. It's going to take a long time to migrate these, uh, these complex systems, so um, please go ahead and work on that right now. We've heard a lot of um, political uh, statements, especially from the US, how they are preparing uh, with their national security memorandums uh, last year. There's just recently been something put out, and you can't read any of that, I suppose, um, from the German government. So they put out an action plan on quantum technologies. Um, but let me highlight some parts in that action plan about quantum technologies that are actually about PQC. Um, namely, so they set some milestones. The federal government of Germany set some milestones um, for 2026. And one of those milestones is to create a migration strategy to post quantum cryptography until 2026. Again, you might say all of this is coming too late, but there's the plan now to, to create this migration strategy uh, in Germany. And we're going to further the migration to post quantum cryptography in the high security systems that have definitely already started. So, what are our guidelines from BSI that we put out? Um, so, there's one uh, guide that we published in 2021 um, that you can go and check out online. Well, there's one in German, but there's also one available in it's an English translation available, um, which is meant to be for the general audience, let's say. So we put a lot of um, effort into explaining the background on quantum computers, explain some basics about PKD protocols as well, explain the mathematical background of PQC a little bit, um, integration of PQC into protocols, um, describe the developments in politics, research, and industry. Of course, this is two years old right now, but nevertheless, I think, especially for the background information, this is quite an interesting read uh, that I can recommend. And we started working on some initial recommendations. Um, in particular, and I've, I've heard Bill talk about this uh, quite a bit, um, we emphasized back then already, um, and I think this is still the thing you need to do um, right now, if you haven't started yet, is to prepare a cryptographic inventory. Be it on paper, if that's the thing you want to start with, be it by uh, purchasing or looking out and doing your research on tools, um, Depends, I guess, also on the situation, but um, this is the first advice I give to people when I meet companies who are just asking about this, saying, well, I've heard about the, this, this threat, and um, I've heard about um, uh, that you're advising to migrate to post quantum cryptography, and I tell them the first thing you need to do is figure out where are you using cryptography in your company, and um, then kind of try to prioritize that list and figure out where you need to do something. It sounds very simple, of course, but I think this is a big task um, because then if you talk to management, then they think, oh, where are we using cryptography? I have no idea, of course. I need to ask my guy, and then the guy doesn't know, and so on. So I think this is a complicated thing um, to do, and it's very good that tools are being developed, and I hope you're learning from uh, what happens in the US and in other countries. Um, we have been emphasizing hybrid solutions a lot. Um, we're still doing that um, for both. Uh, key exchange and for signature schemes. Um, and cryptographic ag agility is something that we emphasized from the beginning. Um, try to make sure when we bring out new products that we will be able to replace the cryptographic primitives, maybe. And well, cryptographic agility as a general design uh, criterion and design goal, I think, is still pretty important. Then, coming a little bit more to the technical level, we put out these technical guidelines which are there for well, the general public, for um, companies um, acting in Germany, but also for uh, government applications. And uh, we went out in 2020 already and said, well, if you need to migrate right now, like for example, in uh, areas where you need to protect classified information, one uh, thing you could do is choose one of the more conservative schemes, photocamera classic Macaulay's, and we're still 
dig into that recommendation uh, right now. Um, as I emphasized before, do it hybridly because there's not a lot of um, implementation um, experience with these schemes, one of the things, and then also um, maybe there are new developments that you need to prepare for this, um, except for hash-based signatures, where we always said, well, maybe here you can afford, um, we, 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 we can uh, go with this to, to do a standalone. <clears throat> Back then, as everyone, and um, as in the CMSA 2.0 also, uh, it has been the stateful hash based signatures. We're hearing more and more from industry that there are uh, quite some difficulties with these, and we're, we're hearing you, <laughs> I'd say. Um, nevertheless, some people are saying, well, I'm pretty sure we can manage the state well, and the schemes are, are there, and they're good. Um, here's a little bit of an outlook. Um, so this is what, what I just presented before was the current state of our um, guidelines, and uh, it's gonna change. There's, uh, every year, um, there's an update. We still stick to protocamera classic McAleese, and um, we're quite happy that there's also some standardization efforts for uh, protocam. Um, and uh, maybe classic McAleese gets standardized by NIST, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe somewhere else, but, um, we're sticking to this recommendation and we still think it's uh, it's good if you can afford it. Um, of course, I understand that not everyone can afford it and then um, Hyper or MLCAM, how it's gonna be called, then uh, will probably be in our uh, guidelines as well. Um, <coughs> same thing for digital signatures schemes. Um, we're gonna put in uh, Strings Plus and uh, Dilithium in there as well. Um, right now, we don't necessarily see the the need for Falcon in our guideline, um, but maybe I can explain a little bit how this works with our guidelines. Usually, um, it's more like a positive list. It's a it's a it's a white list. So it doesn't necessarily mean if if you're um, a company acting in Germany and you have a need for Falcon that it's completely on the blacklist. It's uh, it's not true. It's not like it's not allowed at all. But <clears throat> Um, we don't don't really see the, the need to put it in our guideline on the white list, let's say, because we see so many problems with the complexity of the implementation. Um, and then also the standard is coming later, but we are we're waiting for the final standards actually to put it in our guidelines. Um, as for security levels, we intend to recommend um, security categories three and five. Um, so parameters, all parameters of these security levels uh, are suitable. Um, and we're also sticking to the hybrid solutions. Um, again, this, uh, sometimes you might not be able to afford it, and then it might be necessary to discuss this, but in general, we think it's a good idea to have both of them um, classical uh, schemes, ECC, RSA, uh, pre preferably pro probably ECC, um, except when you use hash-based hash signatures. Yes. Um, well, is the most technical slide maybe of the, of the whole talk. Uh, so when we're talking about hybrids, then it's always nice, of course, to say, well, you, uh, you can use hybrids, um, uh, but how to, how to do it, actually? Um, so we give some, uh, at, in the next update, we give some concrete recommendations. We think the um, KDFs proposed by Etsy, um, concatenation and then KDF or cascade KDF, um, are good to use, then also the ones that uh, Dustin mentioned in this special publication 856C, um, which are based, at least the ones that are based on uh, Ketchak or HMAC, I think um, these are su suitable. We're gonna give out some very concrete advice and uh, probably uh, look at what NIST is doing about this as well, uh, how to use them safely, of course. It's uh, not just point at the document and say, okay, just use it. Um, I think it's important to look at it uh, in detail. There are some relevant drafts li listed here. So I think if you look at the one by Mike Ownsworth, um, and a colleague of mine, Stavis Kuzidis, is also involved in that one. Um, this is an ITF draft, about 10 combiners that uses the um, Ketchak uh, based approach from the NIST special publication, for example. Um, that could be a perfect example how to use it. And there are already some um, hybrid approaches in, in protocols. So in TLS, um, there are a couple of drafts that uh, use hybrid designs. One of them is this uh, I, um, TLS hybrid design one um, that we think is suitable. And in um, Ike, there's, there's also um, 
hybrid uh, solutions to that that all work fine as far as I can see. You might want to mix in a pre-shared key as well. Um, this is something we always think is, uh, of course, suitable. Um, <clears throat> especially, uh, maybe if you haven't prepared for PPC yet, then pre-shared keys, pre keys could also be uh, helpful. And you can put them in as uh, additional enforcement as well. <clears throat> so moreover, we have uh, some projects that we're running with uh, contractors, actually. So one thing that has been mentioned uh, before, I'm leading a project where um, we're implementing post quantum schemes in an open source library called Botan. Um, our contractor here is Oda and Schwarz Cybersecurity, and I'm happy that some people who are participating in this project from the company are actually here. So what are the algorithms that we put in Botan? Um, we've seen some on, the, on this uh, matrix before, actually. Uh, so there's Kyber in there, there's the lithium in there, Springs Plus, XMSS, and LMS are in there as of now. And in the next few months, we're gonna see further kind of test with release as well. So I think we're gonna uh, offer quite a good choice of uh, post quantum camps and in particular our recommendations, of course. And we implemented this TLS uh, hybrid design that I mentioned before as well. So um, this is compatible with the implementations that we find um, at Cloudflare and you can use it um, together with uh, a Chrome browser where you can activate um, Hyper in, in, in this hybrid design as an experimental feature and it works with the Bolton library as well. Then we have a second one um, where we're looking at OpenPGP and Thunderbird for email encryption and signatures. Um, there's an IETF draft, um, so right now this week at IETF 118, uh, I think on Thursday there's a session on OpenPGP and they're gonna recharter and put in um, parts of our efforts, hopefully into the OpenPGP working group to put in post quantum cryptography in OpenPGP um, in a hybrid approach for encryption and for signatures, at least that, that's our proposal here. <coughs> and then the, at the end of the project, um, we're gonna see a proof of concept, uh, hopefully in Thunderbird and the underlying crypto libraries. Okay, and then coming back to the beginning, um, people have been asking what about quantum key distribution. Um, obviously, there's a lot of money in this um, in, in the European Union, um, and I understand that uh, yeah, this, this is something that people are uh, also quite uh, uh, enthusiastic about, let's say. We are a little bit skeptical from the security perspective, um, let's say. We don't think it's mature enough yet, and therefore, we think it's clear that the migration to post-quantum cryptography has the highest priority, and we need to focus on that. But I think it's at the same time, since there are so many um, people looking at this, um, I think it's very important to emphasize that security aspects still need to be analyzed to um, engage in research activities in PKD and look at implementation security at the same time. We think that potentially in the future, PKD could be a complement um, to PPC, or maybe a backup um, in case of disaster, let's say, um, but it's not there yet. So to wrap, wrap up, we've seen uh, we need uh, quantum safe cryptography because uh, quantum computers are uh, obviously endangering public key cryptography. Um, harvest now, decrypt later is one of the scenarios, long migration um, is another scenario that uh, brings us to the point where we need to say, well, we need to act uh, now. Um, we emphasize hybrid mode throughout, and um, we think that PKD is not mature enough. Before I, before I ask some questions, uh, I have a, a brief remark. In the beginning of your talk, you mentioned uh, your work on modular forms and its lack of applicability to cryptography. I know of one theoretical application. Yeah, I, I know of one as well, but I'm... Uh, <laughs> I'm anyway, not, let's yeah. uh, go back to uh, the let's real talk about that here. Uh, <laughs> any questions from the audience? Go ahead. Okay, uh, so I'm trying to repeat the question, um, the part that I understood. So, I've, so you, were, you were asking about Falcon and why not put it in our recommendations as well. You chose it for key length um, mostly, and I can totally see that um, for, for sure. What I tried to emphasize back then was this is our current plan, is one thing. So. We're looking at the draft, we have draft standards of the schemes that are announced here already there. Falcon, there's no draft standard available yet. 
And that's, that's one part why I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to put it in that list. And then, as I said, I, I view it as a, or we view it as a white list. It's not saying everything else um, is for the devil. And uh, so, so that's why we only choose the, the schemes where we really think, um, well, you can use them universally, um, the security levels have been well analyzed, and so on. And that's why we didn't put, or I'm not announcing to put in Tarkin here right now into our technical guidelines, but it's not forbidden. And if you, if you come and say, well, I have this application and I cannot afford a lithium in this application, even that I need Tarkin, then convince this, I'd say. If you'll permit me a follow-up, yes, like sir. Andrea said, um, there is no U European standard, but BSI is a de facto standard. So we, we do have a bit of a pull. So from that point of view, it might actually be that you could write this more, and then we get to a de facto standard without formalizing it uh, in the EU, if you, if you take that, that leading position. Sure, yeah. Um, we are coordinating with uh, European parties. For, for sure, we're talking to our European partners. Thank you. So, uh, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Stefan for his contributions here. In today's complex, fast paced world, you need a partner who can help secure your digital transformation so you can drive your business forward confidently. Someone who can fine tune and integrate the secure technologies that enable mobile identities, digital payments, and a hybrid workforce. You need a partner who will have your back so you can stay focused on the road ahead and accelerate your organization's growth. Invest securing a world in your hands.